think we okay. can. Okay. All righty. Have fun, everybody. Thanks. Hey everyone, we're just waiting for some more people to file in. We're gonna give it a minute um, and then we can get started. Okay. And Sarah Linda, just keep on uh, admitting people as they come in. I'm going to start the program, okay? All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nibblewood Call, a mega miniature virtual tour with uh, miniaturist and gallerist Darren Scala. My name is Olivia Cipriano, and I am the manager of programs and operations at the Hudson River Museum. So before we begin today's program, I just wanted to go over a couple of technical details uh, for our audience members. Upon entry to the Zoom call, your microphone has been turned off. However, your camera is still operating fully. So if you wish to turn off your video, you may do so by clicking on the camera icon located on the left side of your Zoom toolbar, which may appear on the top or bottom of your screen. Um, Darren will also be taking questions throughout the program. So um, you can leave those questions in the Zoom chat a box function, or if you are joining us on Facebook, you may ask these questions in the comment section so that I can facilitate these questions as they come up. Um, and if you're watching post humorously, you may, humorously, you may still leave your questions in the comment section as Darren has so generously offered to answer them um, after the program concludes. So now I would like to uh, thank you all for joining us today for this virtual tour of Nibblewick. Um, the extraordinary miniature mansion on display at Glenview at the Hudson River Museum's historic home. Um, today, miniaturist and gallerist Dan Darren Scala from D. Thomas Fine Miniatures will be taking us through the 24 room dollhouse built by Marco Banks, sharing images and video of the miniature rooms and tiny treasures that fill the house and tell Marco Banks' whimsical stories about the Van Nibblewick family who reside in the home and how they've been coping with shelter in place like the rest of us. Um, this is a great way to get to know the dollhouse before you get to see it in person at the museum. Just so everyone knows, the museum will be opening later this month. However, Glenview and therefore Nibblewick will not be open to the public right away. We are carefully monitoring CDC guidelines to figure out how we can open Glenview in a manner that is safe for both our visitors and staff. So please keep your eyes peeled on our website, www.hrm.org, and our social media pages on Facebook or Instagram for any updates on when Glenview will be open. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our host for today's program, Darren Scala. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, I am so excited to be here. And thank you for this opportunity to you in the Hudson River Museum. Um, I have a very special attachment to Nibblewick Hall. Um, it is an extraordinary uh, dollhouse, uh, as, as, as you've described. Um, but there's so many other things that just get me um, connected to this piece. Um, and, 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 you know, it starts with Marco Banks. And, and he's the creator of Nibblewick Hall. And, and we're going to get into all the details of Nibblewick Hall. But um, he basically spent about 10 years of his life between 1990 and the year two, 1990 and 2000 building this extraordinary home uh, in 112 scale. And the architecture around this Nibblewick Hall that he created is extraordinary in and of itself. Uh, because it captures actually three different distinct styles, architectural styles, that he was inspired by when he was growing up in the New York area, uh, in the Hudson River Valley area. So there's influences of, of Georgian architecture and uh, Victorian architecture, as well as the Dutch influences, which you can see here, the brickwork and the curves in the ceilings and the hundreds and hundreds of individual tiles that he laid down to create this, what I would call 
a masterpiece of 112 scale architecture. And like I said, it took him 10 years to build this, um, this structure and all of the pieces in, included in it, which, is, which numbers over 900 individual items that he and his mother actually helped to put together, a combination of things he purchased from very, very upscale dollhouse shops in the Washington DC area and the New York City area, as well as things he actually crafted with his mom. So his mom would make the rugs and he would buy some of the furniture and they would lay. So this was a labor of love between the two of them, as well as a creation that is collaboration of pieces from artists, miniature artisans, as well as uh, pieces that he has made on his own. So filling this extraordinary mansion. So you just got a chance to see the front of the home. Here is actually the back of 24 rooms, uh, each individually crafted. It's four different layers, okay? So there are four different fours, floors, um, which include an attic level. And the thing about this, which makes Nibblewick Hall so different than, than what I would say traditional dollhouses, it's a really very collaborative, uh, process of combining both the high-end miniatures, well-crafted artisan pieces with things he crafted from items that he found in his linen closet. So for example, there's wallpaper that is captured from a Godiva chocolate Christmas edition box that he used in one of the rooms. So very, very creatively using all his resources together to create this basic masterpiece. So here are some of the rooms. I'm gonna go through uh, many of them in detail, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like when you pull all of those pieces together. So again, influences from where he lived, um, where he grew up, different structures and architectural styling. Um, and of course, what is really, really magical about the Nibblewick Hall and that brings all of this together is the story that he created around this fictional family, the Von Nibblewicks, who live in uh, this structure, Nibblewick Hall, which by the way, the naming of this home came from a Ouija board that he was playing with, with friends um, one night. And that is how he came up with the name Nibblewick Hall. So um, yeah, and, and, and I mean, I think that's just such sort of fun and whimsy bringing it all together with the Van Nibblewick family, who, by the way, have been stuck like we have been at home during COVID. So this has actually been a really great opportunity for the Von Nibblewicks to continue the drama around the story that has been created uh, with these characters, the Von Nibblewicks, because ba Marco Banks spent a fair amount of time creating this story, inspired by a lot of his friends, using similar names that, of his friends um, to include in this story that he crafted around the folks that live in this beautiful structure. So here's the center hall of Nibblewick Hall. It's a double staircase, carpeted, um, beautifully portrait, lots of beautiful portraits lining it, as well as a hidden space underneath the grand staircase, which, which has a place for Patty. Patty is the little character that lives under the stairs that takes care of the Nibblewick family. And Patty's actually named after the Patrick, who was his partner at the time, because Marco Banks, by the way, is no longer with us. He, he had passed back in, in, in the early 2000s. And his, his um, partner, P Patrick, was so generous to, to donate the home to the Hudson River Museum. Uh, but Mark, took care to make sure that his partner had a place in Nibblewick Hall and within the story of the Nibblewick family by creating this mythical character who took care of everybody in the home. This is the first floor uh, kitchen. Um, what's, what's wonderful about the kitchen as well as the rest of the home is it, it, it does capture the historic historical accuracy beyond uh, be, be, behind the structure itself and the time period that that, it, that the home represents as well as the story. So the, the Von Nibblewicks are living sometime in the Victorian era. They're living in a home that sort of represents the Victorian homes of the time in the 1800s, late 1800s. So what's happening here is the kitchen is crafted very much like what you would see back then. And here you have the server in the kitchen and she's creating, she's getting ready for a banquet. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what the banquet is for. But here she's preparing the pig and she's preparing the vegetables and she's getting ready for a party. 
this is actually, I wanted to uh, share, uh, throughout this presentation, I will be sharing sort of um, individual pieces that are represented in the, in the home, just so I can give you an idea of, of how well-crafted they are and, and, and uh, how special each and every piece in this home is. So this is actually hand, hand, handcrafted porcelain, hand-painted porcelain by miniature artisans that have, uh, that, that uh, Marco Banks had scoped out and, and planned to have in, in this home. This is the dining room. It's set for the banquet that I mentioned. Everything you see here, all the silver in this dining room is real silver, hand turned on a lathe by a miniature artisan. So, uh, so that just also gives you an idea of, of the level of, of artistry involved in some of these pieces. This is a close up version of this um, silver, I don't know what the name of this is. Somebody could put that in the, in the box of what this item would be called, but this is hand cut glass on real live silver. This is a punch bowl made of real silver with dangling mugs. And here we have the living room on the first floor. Um, that's Molnair in the background. He's a butler. And this is, um, so the setting here for the, the Nibblewick story is the youngest daughter is getting married and her husband-to-be is coming to this party, obviously for, to celebrate their wedding. But the youngest daughter is actually um, in, really in love with the, her music teacher. So all the drama around this story is about her, her celebration of her marriage, but she doesn't really want to marry this guy. So there's a lot of people who come in and out of the story. And that's just, I uh, just wanted to show, share some of the porcelain pieces that are also on the first floor. Do we have any questions yet? Not yet, but someone did mention that they have a full size version of that cottage teapot that you showed. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. pretty cool. This is just a, this is one of the, um, I would say the a book table that's in the living room. What's so special about this is the top of the table. I'm gonna stop it. This is all hand painted artwork onto the table. That's Bolnair again. This is our lead lady who's getting married, but not really wanting to get married. Lots of drama happening. This is the music room on the first floor. And you can see there's over a dozen musical instruments that have been handcrafted by a Canadian artist. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name, but, they, but one artist is actually responsible for most of these musical instruments, which again are in 12 scale. And you can see every single teeny tiny detail. I mean, that's a hardwood case that's been crafted. And you can see the detail of the grain on the woods and very, very special carvings to create that, that uh, shape. That's one of my favorite pieces in the house. Like they all, like all of them are. So again, this is sort of setting up what's happening uh, later in the day with the wedding and the drama behind the, uh, the lead in this story who's getting married. This is an example of the first floor study where the Von Nibblewick father uh, spends most of his time. If Sarah, we have, if, uh, yeah. Someone was wondering um, if we go back to those, uh, the music room, yeah. um, where these dolls uh, came from and what they're made of. Um, you know what? The, Every, most, most of the dolls are, hand, are handmade by miniature artisans. They're very, very well crafted by artists of the period when he purchased them. Let me go back. But um, I, I would imagine they're porcelain faces, but fabric, real fabric, real lacing, and all of that. That's, yeah. That would be my guess, but I haven't actually studied deeply what they're actually made. I would say they're porcelain. Um, and someone did ask about the story behind the dollhouse, which you are currently telling. Um, and they also asked about if there was a book with it. There is a book that is sold in the gift shop, um, which will be, we're working on opening, hopefully, when the rest of the museum opens. We're trying to figure out the best way to do that. But there is a book and um, you can find it in the museum gift shop when it does open. Right. Uh, so, so I just want to point out a couple of the objects in this study, which include um, this awesome globe, which is hard, made of hardwood. And then some of the, the 
the microscope in the back and some of the other metal pieces are all hand turned pieces to create those objects. And of course the armor is all metal. When we head up to the second floor, this is one of my favorite rooms. This is actually the, the study. Uh, this is actually the sitting room, I'm sorry, which uh, one of the nieces of the Van Dibbelk family is, and you can see this awesome uh, cat that's, that's about to jump on the fishbowl. Pointing out some of the other really, really cool details. If you can see in the back of this, um, all of the, first of all, every room, basically every room has a fireplace and they're all decorated differently. This happens to be a faux marbleized fireplace. It's not totally in, um, in, 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 it's not totally clear, but you can see some of the detail behind the, the faux marbleizing. But some of the other details, if you see above that fireplace, there's a, a butler's bell that, that they used in the Victorian time to, to call the butlers up. So I think that's just, just playing into the level of detail that Marco Banks spent putting this, putting, putting this home together. Now, Marco Banks is, uh, he was alive recently, right? So how old is this house? So the, ho so the house was built between 1990 and 2000. So it took over about 10 years. I think he passed in the early 2000s. So I would imagine the house now is, I don't know, do the math, 2000 to 2020, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years old. Right, but most of, the, most of the objects that he acquired over that 10 year period, some of them might've been made in the 80s, some in the 90s, um, yeah. So this is also, this, uh, this is actually one of the books that are, that, that, are, um, that the niece is actually um, reading in that sitting room. So I wanted to point out that all the pages have writing on them. And it's the legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is paying homage to Washington Irving, who lived in, in the, the Hudson River area. So he really did make sure he got everything in there, which is kind of nice. We're, so still to, to, to continue on the second floor, this is one of the bedrooms for, uh, that uh, one of the Nibblewick Hall Hope folks live in. And this is the mother who's getting ready to prepare the trousseau for the daughter's wedding. Pointing out some of the, this is like faux crocodile leather um, luggage, which I just love, lined and everything. <laughs> because your faux crocodile <laughs> luggage needs to be lined. <laughs> Loving that so much. Um, <laughs> uh, off to the right, uh, in Nibblewood Call is the nursery. And one of the most awesome pieces in the nursery is this 144th scale dollhouse for a dollhouse, which is kind of blows your mind. This was created by a miniaturist. I think her name is, I don't know the names of the miniaturist. I should, I'm sorry. She's awesome. Her name is Sue and she does this beautiful work. I think she's still working in the, in the, in today. And I know there are some miniaturists on the line. So, uh, so you guys put it in the comments, you know who, who made this. <laughs> Let's see. So moving up to the third floor, I know we talk about 24 rooms, 26 rooms. The reality is not every room is counted. There are a couple of additional rooms. So this like the washroom might not have been counted, but, um, but look at the level of detail of the slats, uh, the, 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 the plaster between the slats and the walls, which I love. Um, and, the, and one of the upstairs maids doing the laundry. Um, what else? Let's go. So this is one of the boys' rooms because there's several boys in the family that have actually come home from college and they're part of the story. They're here for the wedding. So everybody's together for this awesome wedding. I just wanted to point out this, um, you know, we talk about the mix of homemade and handcrafted versus, you know, fine crafted miniature. This is an example of a finely crafted miniature. It's all made of hardwoods. If you, if you open some of these drawers, there will be dovetailing. Um, the, the grains of the wood are perfectly proportioned and scaled and look beautiful. So just to give you an example of that versus let's say the flooring in this conservatory on the top, on the third floor, which is probably Christmas wrapping paper. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, look how fabulous it is <laughs> because that was really Marco Banks, his, his talent was really pulling all of these pieces together. So you have you know, I think in the background, you see that Chinese lantern that probably came from a Chinese food, you know, store. But then you look at the birdcage and that's all soldered metal and hand painted gold. So just mm -hmm. pulling all those pieces together are just 
is re yeah. really what makes this house so extraordinary. So yeah, on, someone mentioned yeah. that, going back to the dollhouse for a second, yeah. that Sue Herber may have made the amazing yep, dollhouse. Right. Good guys, good going. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So, so continue on, there's, there's an art gallery on the top floor and that was created for one of the Nibblewicks who uh, used this space to get away from the craziness of the family. What I love about this room is you can see the etchings on the walls, which I love. And then you can see a an inset fireplace, which is lined in brick it, it, on the, the left-hand side, which is pretty awesome. I also wanna just remind, I wanna go back a second before we get to Glencora. One of the other elements of this uh, structure is that although there are three different distinct architectural elements and it's one house, each of the rooms are interconnected. They connect with one another unlike a traditional doll house. So if you, all the staircase lead to hallways which lead to rooms. So if you're in a room on the, uh, if you're in the art gallery, you can actually go through doors and go downstairs to get in any other room, which to me, that's one of my favorite things about this home. So we're actually, again, on the top floor, this is Glencora, which um, this is the grandmother of the Van Nibblewicks and she was jilted at her wedding. So she remains dressed in her wedding gown and she's gone a little cuckoo and she lives in the attic. Uh, I feel a little bad for her, but it's sad, but I, but it is one of the, I think the kind of prettiest dolls, like the more most most interesting dolls uh, in, in, in the entire Nibblewick Hall. But yeah, so that's, Glen, that's Glencora, she's not very happy. So before we go on to, uh, we're gonna talk about the holiday seasons at Nibblewick Hall. Do we have any other questions? Not right now, um, but I will let you know when we get them. So, uh, and I'm gonna, I, I, yeah. So, so what we've been doing with Nibblewick Hall over the last several years is that I've been working with the folks at the Hudson River Museum and miniaturists from really all over the world who have contributed uh, miniatures towards uh, the celebration of the holiday season. So for fall and Halloween, we've been putting together miniatures to help sort of bring the house to life for the holiday. So this is an example of what we did for the fall. And you can see lots of fun Halloween-y things. And over the years, we've actually been uh, adding elements to the structure, which have added to the fall and holiday Halloween season to sort of um, continue the, the celebration. So that was fall, but we can't forget Christmas, which is really, really fun. Wow. Um, yeah, so we do, we do um, for the last several years, we've decorated the house for, we've decorated Nibblewick Hall for Christmas, just to give you an example of what that looks like. That was a little red door that we had created to help bring life to Patty and Patty's little area, you could see a little mouse there. That is and so that's Patty who lives under the stairs and the little cats that are playing. Of course, we have a Christmas tree in the center with lots and lots of gifts. Yeah, we have a question that came in about the clothing. Um, are, is the clothing made from antique uh, materials? You know, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure exactly how the, the fabric, you know, how the dolls were made. Um, I would say that they are made to scale in terms of the fabrics and the patterns. I, 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 they might be, I would, I would think not though at the end of the day, because that's a, it's a little bit of a stretch for the miniaturists who are making the dolls to go and find the fabric and for it to be in good mm -hmm. condition and then to make the doll. The other thing is, you know, um, we don't, we're not hundred percent sure, but Marco Banks might've had these dolls commissioned specifically for his house for yeah. their house because they are they are character dolls and he might have had them created specifically for for him for him um in which case i think it would it would make it a very difficult endeavor to find fabric that's antique for those dolls 
And I have a question from Lisa that um, is I, I can that. answer. Um, the, it's so yes, Glenview is on display for the public. I mean, uh, Nibble a Call is on display in Glenview for the public view um, at the Hudson River Museum. However, Glenview will not be open at first when we reopen the museum. So if you do want to see it, just keep your eyes peeled on the Hudson River Museum website and on our social media accounts to uh, find out when you can come and see it. Yay. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the great things about having Zoom and having this opportunity to, you know, chat with you guys who, you know, it, it, this is a great opportunity for you to get to know the house before you get to see the house because it is a humongous house and there's, there's so much and you can never ever see it all in one visit. It's almost like an opera. It's great to know what the story is before you see the opera so you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. This is a great way to get yourself acclimated. Even though you'll, you'll never see it all in one shot, this is helpful before you get in there because it'll help you focus a little bit. Uh, I wanted to share another uh, element from our Christmas uh, contributions. This is, um, this was a, a, a little croquet set, which was made by an artisan who contributed to the, the Christmas holiday um, event. And like, I, you know, like everything else, or like all of the other really, really beautiful crafted pieces, this is all made of hardwood. These are hand turned croquet. I don't know, we'll call those little blocks at the end. They're all hand turned on a lathe and, and the box is made of hardwood. So just pointing out the, the level of detail around, around some of these objects in, in, in the home. Yeah. So, like I said, when, when um, you know, this is a great opportunity to understand the house before you get to see it. This is the, this is the structure as it is inside, at, in the Glenview, which is this awesome Victorian mansion that's been converted and, and part of the campus of Hut, the, the Hudson River Museum. So the, the room that has been created to uh, surround the Nibblewick Hall is just, is beautiful. The home is beautiful. and. Again, you're gonna to need to figure out how do you spend your time because you can spend a whole day looking at this house and you could spend a whole day seeing Glenview and then you could spend another whole day in the awesome museum next door. So you're gonna to have to work that out, but, but I just wanted to encourage you to take a look at what you will see when you come visit the museum when, when Glenview opens and, uh, and you can see this, this awesome house. It's nine feet wide and about three feet high by about two feet deep, 26 rooms lighted in almost every room has lights. Um, this, the, the house itself was made in three portions. So they actually come apart like a, a, a brick, like a brick mosaic, which actually helps you get into the house and fix things when things break down. As I mentioned, the architectural elements are, are perfectly, scaled and perfectly detailed and inspired by Marco Banks, his life and where he lived in the Hudson River Valley. I don't think I pointed out, but on the, on the lower left-hand side of this house is the kitchen where, you remember where I shared the kitchen on the first floor. To the left of that is a conservatory, a which is all metal and glass and it houses flowers and plants and herbs. And again, back to this historic uh, historical accuracy, you would have conservatories off the sides of the kitchen, which is where they would go capture their, their herbs when they were cooking. So perfect example of, of keeping things to scale and keeping things to, mm -hmm. to being accurate. Yes, Marco Banks did an incredible job and we actually have a few questions about him. Yes. Um, so do we know what his day job was and what neighborhood he lived in? You know, okay, so from what we know, he lived in Greenwich Village in New York City. He um, worked as an actor and a, and a waiter at the time. He actually started the to build a house in, in Greenwich Village, but then he moved to Washington, D.C. And most of the house was built in his Washington, D.C. studio apartment. So... That, I mean, I think what that does, it just plays into his dedication to this, to this endeavor mm -hmm. and his uh, really just, he, he put everything into this house. I mean, if you think about what 10 years is of, of a lifetime and, and all of the thinking that goes into something like this. And don't forget, 
All of these rooms lead to back rooms, which lead to hallways. So if you started in the kitchen, you would go up a spiral staircase to the third floor. You would travel through the back, get to the conservatory and come down those stairs. So, so there's a lot of thinking that went into this. It was definitely a labor of love. It's very interesting that he worked with his mom too. Cause like, how great was that? That they both sort of added to this um, <laughs> and were sort of participating in all of this. Um, but, mo but most of this structure was built in a studio apartment, which is kind of like crazy. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to sort of talk about, which is a big part of, of the Nibblewick Hall story, and as well as the home itself and the period of time that the snapshot in time where this is taken is, this is the Victorian era. And the, and the Victorians believe very much in the concept of fairies and ghosts. So throughout this home, and we can't show you here, but when you come visit, look for them, there are at least a dozen fairies, ghosts, and goblins that are strewn about the house. And I'll give you one little hint. In the center hall staircase on one of the banisters, there's a tiny little fairy that is hanging about waiting for sort of the drama to continue in the home. I mean, I mentioned Patty, he's one of them. There's also a ghost that is entering the center hall in the front, in the front, the front door. And then one, I'll give you one more hint, and you can actually see it in this photograph on the top floor to the right of the of sort of that station in the middle, there's actually a ghost that is breaking through the paned window. There's like a, a 16 glass paned window. And there is a ghost that is popping through. So there's always something to see in this house. There's so much going on at different times and at different parts. Um, and, and it's a fascinating story that, that all comes together with this Victorian home, with this Victorian family and the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, do we know if Mark O'Banks made any other houses or was this? <laughs> I, think this I think this would be enough. I don't, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, we don't know that. We don't yeah. know. That. But we do know that it, 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 he started collecting the objects before he actually started building the house. Okay. Um, and so it, he probably had it in his mind what he wanted to do and he just started to acquire and acquire and because in the miniatures world if you see something that you want you need to get it right away because it might not be there again or the artist might not make another one so mm -hmm. he he um we have a lot of the receipts from where he purchased a lot of these items so not only do we know the value which by the way there is an incredibly high value to a lot of these items to these objects, but clearly he had a really good relationship with the shop owners and he had a great relationship with the artists that were making the pieces. A lot of them were handmade for him. Um, bless you. <laughs> uh, so what's great about that is we have, we have that level of detail of, of who the artists are. Many of these pieces are signed by the artists who made them. And Marco Banks was very, very detailed. We have Excel spreadsheets, which detail every object, where he got it, um, what his thinking was behind the characters, who the characters are that relate to his to him and his life. So it's a great thing that we have all of that because it it really mm -hmm. helps pull the whole story together. Yeah, we have a few more questions coming in. We uh, yeah, we love some very curious minds over here. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna skip ahead because there was a lot of questions about Marco Banks. Yeah. Um, so Annette was wondering if you had any more details of the ghosts and fairies in this PowerPoint. <sighs> I don't have more information on the fairies and the ghosts, but we do have, like I mentioned, we have the, the main ghost who is coming out of the, 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 the Cathedral of the Lost Souls is that attic room, is the name of that attic room. And, and actually the, the ghost that's coming out of that, that roof is one of the ancestors of, Nibblewick, of, of the Van Nibblewicks. Um, so we do know a little bit about all of the, all of the different, of the ghosts and who they are in relation to the story. But I don't have any more photographs of them. A lot of them are really, really tiny. So you have to kind of go see them because the fairies have wings and, and, and they're, they're delightful. They're really delightful. Yeah, I think you mentioned this before, um, but approximately how long did it take to make this uh, house? So he started making it in 1990. He finished the house in around the year 2000. So it took him about 10 years to build this house. 
Um, he didn't get to quite finish it actually because he he was ill and he and he and he um, so he actually didn't finish the house. So there are a number of things that he didn't get to um, either acquire or make himself. And we actually have that in the archives. We we know what those things are. And a personal endeavor of mine would would be to would to be to one day to get some of those pieces made so that that his wishes could actually come true and 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 have that done. Like I think there's a table that he wanted to have and a, it fit within the story and it fit in one of the rooms and it wasn't he, he didn't get to it unfortunately because he he did actually get sick towards the end of of 2000 and he was losing his eyesight. So. I mean, just the fact that he was able to finish this house to this point, being ill, is a real testament to his determination to get it done. Yeah. Um, no, it, I mean, I can't imagine spending that much time on anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and being that intimately involved, because a, a project like this, one thing leads to another, which leads to another. And I'm sure, mo you know, artists out there know that and you know crash people know that and, and it's it's never done and it's never easy and there are always challenges that come around and and this to me which makes the home so extraordinary is that it is not only so detailed and historically accurate but there is a rhyme or reason to each room and they do interconnect and that is not an easy accomplishment it, I, you don't see this every day I mean there, there are scale models that do that but this is this is more of a traditional dollhouse in one yeah. scale. Um, and there are parts of this house that you never see because they're behind walls, but you know that he finished them. Yeah, you know and you can, you can kind of see, um, if you look from the other side, not the cut side, you can kind of see into the windows a little bit right. if you look really exactly. close too. Exactly. It's, it's incredible. The outside, but you know it's finished. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy. There are um, a lot of doors that open. There are a lot of secret passageways. There are a lot of trap doors. In fact, the, the Cathedral of the Lost Soul attic room has a trap door that leads to the boys' room underneath. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Laura was wondering if the ghosts in the cathedral, um, if they were supposed to die in a skating accident yeah. or something. Yes, so, I mean, there is a part where... that, That's yeah. right. There is a part of the story that there was a, a family member of the Von the, the Von Nibowicks that was lost um, to an ice skating in, in, a, in a, who passed away drowning in an ice skating rink. Yes, so that is good. Good that you know that part of the story. That's amazing. I mean, there are so <laughs> many little details of this story that's just, yeah. And all yeah. of the characters are named after people that Mark knew or were inspired mm -hmm. by people he knew, which I think is really nice. He sort of gave, he, he, he sort of paid homage to many of his friends. That's in that yeah. way. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in that vein, like, do we know how this came to the Hudson River Museum or if his mother's still around? I don't know if his mom is still around, but I do know, and I would, I would think not, but we, we do know that his partner at the time donated the home to the museum. And that, that was probably a huge endeavor in and of itself, getting that house to the museum. It's like mm -hmm. I said, it, it actually comes in different parts, uh, but but to disassemble and then reassemble might have been a humongous endeavor. But kudos to you guys. Yeah, and 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 interestingly, the the cabinet that this piece is on is is a cabinet that was not made specifically for Nibblewick Hall, but it was a piece that had been part of the FDR house that they the Hudson River Museum acquired, and just it just so happens that it fits perfectly in that glass cabinet. So it's really like almost meant to be. And it is a beautiful cabinet. Like I said, the room is beautiful in the Glenview that this is in and the cabinet is beautiful and it sits so perfectly on it. Um, but yeah, so uh, um, yeah, so his mom, we don't know, but his, but his partner donated the house, which was really a lovely thing to do. Yeah, um, it really is. And uh, someone asked if Mark actually wrote down the story um, oh, Laura just answered. Mark made notes about the story, but did not yes. write them out fully as text. Um, we also right. got a question about you. Me? So, yes. Um, someone was asking a little bit about your background. Oh, that's so nice. So mm -hmm. um, I am an unapologetic miniaturist. I like. To, um, I have a I have a retail business selling fine miniatures. I also promote miniatures at every chance I get. 
So I hold gallery exhibitions, I hold online shows, I do pre presentations like this. I also have a, a sort of like a podcast, you would call it, where I do a Meet the Miniature series. So I would definitely say, um, check out my website, check me out on social media to find out what events and activities I have going on. But essentially, um, I live and breathe for tiny objects. And so I started this little business about five years ago and I do everything I can to promote miniatures. But my main objective is really to have folks see miniatures kind of the way I see them, which is this is not only about playthings, but these can be artistic objects. They can be um, you know, very highly crafted objects. They can be toys, but they can also be awesome, awesome objects and things to get inspired by. So it's, it's so really, it's about trying to have folks be as inspired as I am around these tiny things and maybe see it in a different way that they might have not seen it before. So in a way that they might not have seen it before and be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. So so I sell miniatures, I promote miniatures and, um, and yeah, and I, and, I, and I don't apologize for it because, and I say that only because pe when people think of miniatures, they think of toys and they think, oh, how sweet you play with toys, but you know, it's so much more than that. And so, and that's, and that's really where I spend a lot of my time is showing these beautiful objects to have people see them differently. Fine crafted porcelain, hand painted oil portraits in 112 scale, um, furniture that is made in, in, in the real world in the same way that you would find it made in miniature. So that's who I am. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone was wondering if you had been to the miniature museum in Tucson. I can never say this. Tucson? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the mini time machine, I have not been there and I want to be, that is definitely on my bucket list. But if folks, if folks are inspired by this, I would say first and foremost, you need to see Nibblewick Hall. It's a great <laughs> place to start and it will take you a lot to go through and see. Uh, but a couple of other things on my list would be uh, the Thorn Rooms at the Chicago Institute. I would say at the Museum of the City of New York, there's a fabulous dollhouse called the Stettheimer Dollhouse. In, in, in the UK, there is the Queen Mary Dollhouse. So there are, there are um, I would, uh, if, you're really, if you're really getting into this, I would just check out my blog because I do posts, there are posts there on all my favorite structures and dollhouses and museums to see and to put on your list. Um, but but there's lots to see in the mini world, absolutely. Lots and lots. Yes, um, and so we also had a question about your web address. Should I link them to D. Thomas Miniatures? D. Thomas Fine Miniatures.com, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you can check out, I, I do um, event listings on my website, so you could always know what's going on. I have a contact list, so you can get on my list, so you can you can get invited to my events and things like that. Yeah, we would love to have you be part of this little mini community. Um, you know, the, the miniatures community is pretty active and growing, I would say. Uh, over the last several years with, with the activity around social media and the kind of content this is, is um, perfect for social media because it's very visually oriented. So there are many, many sites and many promoters who are, um, helping spread the word about these things. So there's there's definitely communities out there and places you can get actively involved. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, we have a question from one of our docents, Karen. Hi, Karen. She's asking um, if his mom made the carpets. Yes, absolutely. How, how did you know that? So yeah, his mom actually did make most of the carpets. Some of may have been purchased, but that's that was his mom's contribution. She, she uh, did a lot of petty point work, which is, Needlepoint in a very, very, it's many, many dozens of, 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 of stitches per inch, anywhere from 40 to 60 to 100 per inch of stitch makes some of these rugs have been created using petty point, which is very, very fine stitching. But yeah, that was the mom's contribution. Um, most of Mark's contribution, obviously, is the design and the structure. And, and he, or he created, he put together a lot of what the portraits you see on the walls are not necessarily hand painted, but they are um, basically printed pieces and framed, but, but each, one on, each one hanging on the wall has a purpose and a meaning um, and, and, and ties into history. But that was Mark's, that was really Mark's. Mark's strength is around structure and, and he had a really, really good eye for, for miniatures. I would say, yeah. 
um, there, there are some of the world's finest miniatures, miniaturists have created pieces that are in this house right now. Mm -hmm. Going back to uh, Mark in DC, do you remember yeah. where in DC he was living in that studio apartment? I want to say DuPont Circle, but I can't be 100% sure. I yeah. don't know. Um, and and in, in all the receipts, there is a there is the name of the shop that he, he shopped in, which is no longer there, unfortunately. A lot of the dollhouse shops over the last decade have actually closed down as the business sort of moved online. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, yeah, I, I don't know where he was living, but I do know he shopped in Washington, D.C. for a lot of these pieces. Okay. And um, you were mentioning a lot of other dollhouses that are available to see. And yeah. uh, someone was wondering if you're aware of any similar dollhouses in Latin American communities or countries. You know, um, I don't know if there's anything this extensive in Latin America. Um, I don't know. I would love to know if, if there are any. Uh, the thing is that a lot of museums have miniatures in them. We just don't know about it because they don't get publicized. And I, I, what I have heard is that, you know, there are a lot of miniatures in basements in, in, in museums because they don't, they, they don't bring them up to, to give them life. Uh, you know, dollhouses like this, there are really very few places that they can actually go at the end of the day. Who has the room for this? Who, who has the money for something like this? So they end up in museums, they get donated to museums, but they don't actually get put out, which is why I love the Hudson River Museum because they have put so much energy and love behind this structure. You don't find that sort of support everywhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if anybody's in the comment section, do you know? I would love to know about it. I don't know of any in South America or Latin America even, but I do know that there are some fabulous miniaturists that are starting to come out of places like Mexico and Brazil and Argentina that are making some fabulous, fabulous tiny objects. Um, but I, I almost feel like there is a movement happening. Um, yeah. That um whether it's from crafting all the way up to high-end miniatures, there's there's a lot of energy behind miniatures today. I mean, even on social media, making miniature things for your pets and taking pictures of it, you know, it's- <laughs> That's right. I think people are <laughs> people are getting that, that tiny is a great way to make people sort of focus in, concentrate and get a specific point. Mm -hmm. um, it really does make you look deeper and inward. And uh, it's a great form of communication because it makes you really focus. So yeah, yeah I see that, I see it. And I, I also see a lot of commercial brands using miniatures to help promote their brands and products. Uh, we are, you know, before bef five years ago, I would see maybe one every year. I see maybe three to four or five commercials being done supporting, supporting miniatures. Um, for example, car companies, KFC did a miniature commercial. Um, again, if you really want to get a, a, a deeper dive, I my blog posts definitely focus in on what I see around miniature. So check it out. What, what is your blog address so that I can put it in the chat? So on my website, it's it. Uh, you go to www.dthomasfineminiatures.com and then it's backslash bl blog, I think. Okay, let me try. Um, yeah. But I have a number of of posts because, you know, this is this this is what thrills me. So when I see a commercial about miniatures, I make sure I get it to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and also, when miniatures are featured in film, um, is also really really exciting. Well, didn't they do a miniature for even like the Harry Potter set um, for those really big shots? Yeah, there but was a time that that. Uh, movie companies were moving towards CGI to, to mm -hmm. create miniatures. And what I think they've learned, because they actually turned completely back around and now using miniatures a lot, is that you really don't get the same level of realism, believe it or not. And there's also movie companies and film companies that are sort of doing a, a synergy of both. But there's a lot more hand building that's happening in the miniatures world, um, uh, you know, versus in the, in the past when it might have moved right to CGI. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we're having a lot of fun comments in here about different uh, places to see different miniatures. Um, Laura was talking about uh, 
they had miniature dioramas in the Memphis history at the Pink Palace Museum. Okay. Um, which is pretty awesome. cool. Um, the in UK, the UK, the V&A Museum of Childhood has a big collection of dollhouses, including the Queen Mary's you were talking about. And she put a yes. little link in the chat if you guys are interested Perfect. in taking a look at it. Um, and then someone mentioned that Wes Anderson also uses a lot of miniatures in his movies, which I have yeah. noticed as well. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, he's a big supporter of miniatures. Yeah, there's there's a short list of celebrities also that are into miniatures. There's folks like Demi Moore. She loves miniatures, miniature, miniatures. Um, Olivia Wilde loves miniatures. Um, there are a couple, yeah. Um, um, Mindy Kaling loves miniatures. So yeah, it's always good to know a celebrity that's into it because it's fun to have that connection. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, all right. Are there any more questions that anybody wants to put in the chat that we haven't answered or anything that maybe I skipped over on accident and didn't get answered that you can put those right in the chat again? Um, or if you we haven't gotten to something and we do end up closing without you having a chance to ask, you can always send me an email um, at programs at hrm.com and I can send those questions over to Darren to get, um, I mean, hrm.org. Um, I can send those questions to Darren. I just put the email in the chat as well. Um, so uh, some CK Salons is asking, will you visit another museum soon? Will I visit another museum soon? Yeah, I think like maybe do a program is what they're asking. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime anybody wants to hear anything about miniatures, I am on board. Trust me, because <laughs> it's because it's like um, you know this is a niche within a niche, you know, and mm -hmm. you know art within art. You're never going to have everybody interested in what you're talking about and what you're saying. And this is really a hard concept for people to grasp because most of us have grown up thinking miniatures equals dollhouse and dolls and kids, and and that's the end of it. But like I said, my 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 big focus is really having people see these at a deeper level and see them at, as having a lot more meaning to them than yeah. you might think. So mm -hmm. I'm all about spreading the word and getting um, folks inspired. Yes. Uh, so we have a couple of questions on Facebook. One question is, uh, how much is the summit of the cost of this whole project? Do you, do you well, know? at the end of the day, you really can assign a, a value to this because it really is invaluable. You can never recreate this. Um, however, you know, if you wanted to break down the receipts, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of money. Let's just say a lot of money. So I can give you an example of of what a a hand carved burl wood secretary that has twelve drawers that are that have that have dovetailing and and brass fittings. Th these cost thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm you know, there are dozens and dozens of books that are in Nibblewick Hall that are handcrafted and, and as you saw, have pages that have writing in them. Hundreds and hundreds of dollars for each book. Um, yeah. Because it takes, most of the, most of the cost is around time. And it takes hours and hours and hours to craft some of these pieces. So you really cannot assign a value to this home. But all I can say is, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, um, we also had another question on Facebook about um, uh, miniature railroads and miniature houses and if they kind of ever converge on in any like form. Um, well, you know, like in life, there are factions. And so the, the mass majority of people might see everything that's tiny in the same class. But when you break it down, the miniaturist and the dollhouse enthusiasts will see 12 scale miniatures and maybe half scale miniatures as one separate you know, entity. And then there are the model railroaders. Miniaturists don't know anything about the model railroaders and the model railroaders don't know anything about the miniaturists because there's enough for us to think about in our own little worlds. But, um, but so they don't really intersect other than sometimes we buy some of the same pieces from the same vendors. So for example, we might buy lights that are made by the same vendor and get used by different, by those two different categories, the railroaders and the, the dollhouse enthusiasts. So they don't really intersect. Um, and the biggest, the biggest thing is that the scale is usually, is the big difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, and then we have, I think, time for probably one more question. Um, Melina asked, how did you get involved with the Hudson River Museum? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I mean, I know <laughs> I went to see Nibblewick Hall and I was just blown away. I don't remember the connection, how, I don't know how that happened. I don't know, I don't remember. Maybe, I don't know, is anyone on from the museum who knows? I don't know what happened first, like, but I just knew that I was just so thankful to have this association because I love this, this home. I love Mar what Marco Banks has done. And, you know, I, and it's just really extraordinary because there's really nothing else out there that exists like it anywhere. So mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'm thankful I'm able to, to be here. <laughs> Me too. Um, all right. Well, that was a short answer. So why don't we take one more question before we uh, decided to uh, decide to kind of conclude. Um, someone was asking, how were the rooms planned in detail before they were created? They had to have been extensively. Lots and lots and lots of thought had to go into each and every decision that he made when making this house. I mean, I can't go into huge detail, but but the fact that his fireplaces actually had hearths that went through like a traditional house would, there's a lot of thinking that had to go, go into that. The fact that there are lights in every single room had to account for wires and those had to go somewhere. So there's a lot of thought into that. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from the decorative elements, there are architectural elements that needed to have been thought out very, very carefully before he put this house together. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, lots and lots. That's why it took 10 years. And I'm sure, you know, he made mistakes along the way and had to redo things and, but look at what we got. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's incredible. And, it really you know, it is. It just really is. And Darren, we thank you so much for being here with us today and just sharing this. Um, there's so much, even like as someone who used to give tours in Glenview, yeah. uh, there's so much more I learned today than I, I ever knew about Nibblewick. Oh, awesome. I'm so happy about <laughs> learning. Um, cool. To everyone who has questions that were not answered in the chat, you can head on over to Facebook if you have Facebook and answer those questions there. I also provided my email in the chat, programs at hrm.org. And I can send those uh, questions over to Darren, who has so generously offered to to help out with that. Yeah. Um, I want to say thank you all, um, both on Facebook and on Zoom, for joining us today. Your attendance and participation in these programs are really what keeps the museum alive and running. Um, the museum is opening up later this month. Um, we're going to have a couple of days. Um, before uh, Saturday, the I believe it's the 25th. Let me just check those dates real quick. So um, we're gonna have a couple of days on the 23rd and 24th where the museum is open to uh, members only as a little preview. And then following um, on Saturday, the 25th, we're gonna be open to the entire public. Um, so to visit the museum, you're going to have to reserve a time. So you can either call into the museum, which is you can find the number you can find on the HRM website, www.hrm.org, or you can register online for those once those uh, get posted. So um, with that being said, again, thank you everyone. We have programs coming up later this week. Um, so please stay tuned, check out our social media um, and our newsletters coming out in the emails for the upcoming programs. Um, Darren, again, thank you so much. We cannot thank you enough for being here with us today. Pleasure. And um, everybody have a safe and wonderful rest of your day. Yay. All right, thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye everybody.